Bhakto Sambudasa Namo Tasa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambudasa Namo Tasa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambudasa Homage to him, the blessed one, the worthy one, the fully enlightened one. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. So I want to Happy welcome everyone. Happy Asian Festival for everybody. <laughs> I want to uh, welcome everybody here. And we're going to uh, talk tonight about the VSAC. And if all of you might know the story already, but I'm going to uh, tell you a little bit about what happened with the Buddha. And it's interesting because uh, Gautam Buddha, he, um, when he was born, um, he was born on this date in this full moon. And then he awakens on this full moon. And then he goes into Paranibbana and this full moon. And so this is interesting. And I've heard from archaeologists um, saying that sometimes when an avatar comes, like a, a very wise person, this can happen. And it happened with the Buddha. And so in the time of the Buddha's birth, um, what was happening with enlightenment is you had many, many groups in India and they're all competing to try to, to wake up. They know there's something, they're trying to open the mind and they're working with this. However, at that time, they were working more with the body, not just with the mind like this. And, um, and everything, we're going to talk a little bit about what he did uh, on his struggle on his way to get to enlightenment. We might do that, but first let's get him born. That would be the good place to start. So he is living in a kingdom in Kapalavatu, and this is a place in Northern India, okay? And King Sudana is his father and his mother is Mahamaya. And when the baby is coming, they decide to name the baby Siddhartha. Many stories are here. My story is not going to be very elaborate because if you read most of the stories, go into what happened precisely with uh, the mother, Queen Maya. But as a mother, I can tell you this was hard. She was in a carriage on the way to one of the places, uh, either coming back to her home or to her parents' home, and um, she goes into labor. She has to get out of the carriage and rest under a tree when it starts to come very very hard and she's assisted by the maid, uh, maidens who are taking care of her and they help her to go under a particular tree and the tree has drooping there's trees in in asia that have these beautiful drooping you know branches and um, there's one tree that she was holding on to and she had to give birth in that position holding on to the tree she was asking the tree bend down bend down the story is the tree the branch came down she was able to hold on to that and then she was able to get low enough to give birth but the recorded story tells us that when he was in the pregnancy itself the bodhisattva had pure mindfulness inside of the womb from past lifetimes and everything that he had developed so far throughout his time in the womb the birth was coming on the uh, on the full moon day in may and during the time he was in the womb with the mother she was carrying this baby for 10 months now my teacher straightened me out on this because I said it was a 10 month baby. And we know he was a very tall man and from all the descriptions and everything, but you see, you're talking the moon calendar and the moon calendar, I was figuring it out. The moon calendar is like nine, uh, 10, of the, 10, of the, um, 10 of the 30 day months in the moon calendar would be 300 days. 
and nine of the 31 day months would be about 279. So no matter how you look at this, he probably was a 10 month baby. And he was probably pretty, pretty large from the description of him as an adult. He could, we don't know how much he weighed, but he could be a, a, a pretty good sized baby, eight, nine, 10 pounds. Um, and so throughout the time, uh, uh, let's see, the father, um, no, let's say, I wanted to say that the mother, she, she was able to communicate uh, with the Bodhisattva while he was in the womb. This is one of the very interesting things. Now, when he came down to be born, before he went into the womb with the mother, okay, um, he comes from the Tusita heaven to this world by his mother's womb. And at the time during the pregnancy, there were four deities who came down to guard her pregnancy. And they did this because they knew he was going to be the Buddha and because they wanted to protect him, make sure that it was okay that he survived and everything. And Maya could see the Bodhisattva while he was in the womb. And she was with the baby for four days, five days, seven days day post-birth, Maya died, Queen Maya died. And then she's, the baby is raised by his aunt, the mother's sister, and, and she takes care of him. And at the birth, the gods are the ones who received him. And they say that when he came out, the story goes, that they, um, they sat him in front of his mother and the baby was born pure. He was not looking like a newborn. He was born very pure and clean. But when he was born, two water spouts formed in the sky and came down and the one water spout was warm and the other one was cool. And this is where we get the ceremony for bathing of the baby Buddha. And some traditions celebrate that. It's kind of fun because everybody comes up, takes a turn bathing the Buddha statue, the baby Buddha. And then he took seven steps while uh, on white lotuses towards his mother. And he, he said, I am the highest, the best and the holiest in the world. And the baby walked seven steps towards his mother announcing this and lotuses popped up the uh they say the lotuses popped up from the moist ground all around beneath his feet everywhere he stepped a lotus popped up and said this is my last birth in the world and so he announces this now you know it's interesting because i try to figure out how can a baby walk and i think I'm hypothesizing that this story comes down to us because there is something that happens when babies are born and the pediatrician can pick up the baby when it's first born and the feet want to walk. The feet want to walk. But this baby was large enough, they're saying that he could help, he could handle himself. And, and then the part about speech, I'm not sure I buy that, but it's a wonderful story. The whole myth story, this part of it is very, very precious to everyone. And then we go into what he was actually teaching. Now, I want to introduce you to some things that I marked here and just give you a few sayings that you might want to hang on to. They're really beautiful. He certainly taught about change. He taught the Anicca, Dukkha, and Anatta. And the Anicca is the impermanence of absolutely everything. Nothing comes and stays and is permanent. Everything that comes or happens in our world, in life, throughout our life, it arises, it's there, and it passes away. And this is what happens, yeah? Everything changes nothing is without change is the first one 
Another gem is you yourself, as much as anybody in the entire universe, deserve to your own love and affection. This is about compassionately taking care of yourself, taking care of this body that carries you through the world, taking care of your health, eating right, having exercise, taking care of yourself so that you are able to teach uh, what the Buddha um, has uh, taught and able to take care of the monks to protect and preserve the teaching. Another thing that he talks about is how a great deal about is how life is an illusion. And this is not restricted to just Buddhism, but we hear this in other, um, other faiths as well, especially in India. We hear about the Maya, the dream, but life is an illusion. It's a dream, a bubble, a shadow. Nothing is permanent. Nothing is worthy of anger. Nothing is worthy of dispute. There is absolutely nothing. And he says, if we can look upon our work, not for self-benefit when we are working in the world, but as a means to benefit the society, we will be practicing appreciation and patience in our lives. And whatever goes around comes around. When you take care of others, they take care of you. That's what happens in, in the teaching. He brings this out. And another one is that until um, man, <laughs> mankind or humankind has unconditional and unbiased love for all beings, man will not find peace. And this is very true, very true. We have so many people on the earth at this time, we should be thinking about the planet and this species in terms of that, but we're not there yet. But eventually we have to get there in order to survive. Eventually we have to get to thinking that way. So what he's teaching is about feeling and learning how to detect feeling that is rising, is present, and disappears. And then he's teaching about perceptions that arise and are here and they disappear. His teaching about perception or perceiving, naming things, deciding how to name them, what adjectives to put onto them, has to do also with atta and anatta and Atta and anatta, we have a special way when we teach twim of explaining this that makes a lot of sense. When we read the text, to think of it this way, you can try it for yourself. But atta is, is about I, me, my, and mine. Thinking this is me, this is mine, this is myself. When I see Everything I see, everything I hear, everything I smell or taste or touch in the outside world is me. It is mine. It is myself. But is that really true? And there are suttas that are preserved where the Buddha is teaching us how to understand how that happened. How did we get to thinking like that? Because everyone around us was thinking that when we were growing up. And so we assumed that that was the way everything was. But the question is to find peace. If we believe everything is personal, then it, it goes further. If it's personal, then it's my fault. I'm to blame. And then I don't, I start feeling guilty and I should have, could have, would have done something differently, you see? And I worry about how I could have done it too much in the, from the past. And that's a burden on us. You, you see me always talking about the little car. You know, I bring this little car out. And I say to you, you know, you're in the car and you're little moving through life like this, driving all the way from birth, all the way to death. And this is your present time. This is the only place 
you and I are alive. We are not alive anymore in the past back here, and we are not to the future yet. The question is, why are we struggling so hard with the past? Why are we struggling with so much worry about the future? When it comes, it's time to do something. But the past is gone. It's fixed in time. And we keep bringing it up and reacting in our present time instead of responding to what is actually happening here and now. When we do that, we're causing ourselves a lot of stress. We're causing ourselves a lot of pain. We're feeling very, very badly inside, losing sleep, not eating, having headaches. All these things are happening. Yeah? Why do we do that? Because we don't know any better. We don't know there's another way. So Atta is this personal way of looking at the world and taking everything that happens very personally. It can get very heavy. But if we look on the other side, anatta, anatta, what happens then? The anatta, this is not me. This is not mine. This is not myself. This is my I meeting color and form and I consciousness with contact happening. And with contact happening, feeling arises, felt as pleasant or painful or neither painful nor pleasant. And from there, it goes on and develops. With feeling as condition, craving arises. And craving is the first place that Atta comes out. I was just reading, um, I was just reading yesterday in a, in a sutta and actually said it straight out that the um, craving is the point where the person forms the eye. That is where the eye pops up. That's the spot. Let's see if I have it here. Let's do some, I think I saw delusion. Delusion is the self-deception. Delusion can be uh, translated to be self-deception to understand what that is. The deception of the idea, everything is on me. I have to carry the world like Atlas carrying the whole world. And we get to places in our life where we feel that way and we should try letting it go, relaxing, smiling, coming back and looking what is really essential, what is here and now, what is just in that present time, in that present time. So when we go back to the Buddha, we look at here, what was he actually trying to do when he was practicing? What was going on with the practicing? There was a discussion. We're going to look at the Mahasachika Sutta from the eyes, through the eyes of the Mahasachika Sutta, okay? Najima Nikaya number 36. If you have the uh, Bhikkhu Bodhis uh, Majima Nikaya, you can go to 332, page 332. So when he starts talking about, there are, for example, many people uh, that go naked and rejecting the conventions and they're licking their hands and not coming when they're asked. They're not stopping when they're asked. These were many of the practices happening. They do not accept food brought or food specially made or an invitation to a meal. They receive nothing from a pot, from a bowl, across a threshold, across a stick, across a pestle, from two eating together, they do not receive anything, or from a pregnant woman, or from a woman giving suck, from a woman in the midst of men, from where food is advertised to be distributed, 
or from where a dog is waiting or from where flies are buzzing. They accept no fish or meat. They drink no liquor, wine, or fermented brew. They keep to a, one house, one morsel. They keep to two houses, two morsels, that's all. Or keep to seven houses with seven morsels. They might live on one saucer full a day or two saucer fulls a day or seven saucer fulls a day and they take food once a day, once every two days, once every seven days, and thus even up to once every fortnight, they dwell pursuing the practice of taking food at the stated intervals. But do they subsist on so little Ajivasana? No, Master Godama, sometimes they consume excellent hard food eat excellent soft food, taste excellent delicacies, drink excellent drinks, thereby they again regain their strength and fortify themselves and some of them become fat. What they early, earlier on abandoned, they later gather together again. That is how there is increase and decrease of the body. But what have you learned about the development of the mind? And when Sachika, the Nagantha's son, was asked by the Blessed One about the development of mind, he was unable to answer. And then the Blessed One told him what you have just spoken of on, as the development of the body is not the development of the mind. It's the development of the body according to the Dhamma, not, not the development of the body according to the mind, Dhamma in the noble one's discipline. Since you do not know what development of body is, how could you know what the development of mind is? But nevertheless, as to how one is undeveloped in body and undeveloped in mind and developed in body and developed in mind, listen and attend closely to what I will say. And then he goes on and tries to explain about his teaching a bit. Here, a pleasant feeling arises in an untaught ordinary person and touched with that pleasant feeling, he will lust after pleasure and continue to lust after pleasure. And that pleasant feeling of his ceases. And with the cessation of the pleasant feeling, painful feeling arises, disappointment that the pleasant feeling has ceased. Touched by the painful feeling, he will sorrow, grieve, and lament, and weep, beating his breast, and become distraught. And when the pleasant feeling has arisen in him, it invades his mind and remains because the body is not developed. And when that painful feeling has arisen in him, it invades his mind and remains because the mind is not developed. Anyone in whom in this double manner, a risen pleasant feeling invades his mind and remains because the body is not developed. And a risen painful feeling invades his mind and remains because mind is not developed, is thus undeveloped in the body and undeveloped mind. So here he's talking to some of the approaches at that time and how is one developed in body and developed in mind. Here, pleasant feeling arises in a well-taught noble disciple or follower, touched by that pleasant feeling. He does not lust after pleasure and continue to lust after pleasure. We do not try to make anything continue. You must remember in your practice that anything that arises will always pass away. And we do not try to make it stay any longer. We simply watch it as it arises, is there, and passes away. That pleasant feeling of his ceases. With the cessation of the pleasant feeling, painful feeling arises. Touched by that painful feeling, he does not sorrow, grieve, and lament, and weep, beating one's breast. Because he is distraught. When the feeling, pleasant feeling has arisen in him, 
It does not invade his mind and remain because the body is developed. And when the painful feeling has arisen in him, it does not invade his mind and remain because mind is developed. And anyone in whom in this double manner, arisen pleasant feeling does not invade the mind and remain because the body is developed and arisen painful feeling does not invade the mind and remain because the mind is developed is thus developed in body and developed in mind. So what did they develop? <laughs> they developed right effort. Right effort, uh, right, uh, let's see, right effort, right observation and right concentration or right collectedness of mind. Six, seven and eight in the eightfold path, those three are dedicated to showing you what it was he was practicing in order to fulfill the Eightfold Path and the Four Noble Truths and Dependent Origination. That's what was happening. Those three little pieces, if they change across time, then we lose the ability to get to the attainments. Everything stops then we have to say something about why we're not getting to those, to Sotapanna, Sakadagami, or Anagami. Why? Because we are trying to get there, because we want to make it happen, because we are working too hard, we cannot get there. But we don't see it unless someone is saying, let's go back and listen very closely to what he was really saying, okay? He says, I have confidence in Master Gotama. Thus, Master Gotama is developed in body and developed in mind. Your words are offensive and discourteous, but still I will answer you. This is the Buddha saying this back to him, the son, one of the sons of the Naganta Nikuta. Since I shaved off my hair and beard and put on a yellow robe and I went forth from the home life into homelessness, it has not been possible for a risen pleasant feeling to invade my mind and remain or for a risen painful feeling to invade my mind and remain. He's not holding on to anything anymore, you see. He's awake. He's a living what flows and comes and arises and is there and passes away. But he's not trying to hold on to anything and make it stay longer. Instead, he's relaxing into the natural flow, the natural flow of the outcome of his teaching. Has there never a arisen in Master Gotama a feeling so pleasant that it could invade his mind and remain? Has there never arisen in Master Gotama a feeling so painful that it could invade his mind and remain? Why not? Is that so? Why is it not so? Here before my enlightenment, he's going to tell him the things he tried now. Listen to what he went through. While I was still only an unenlightened bodhisattva, I thought household life is crowded and dusty, life gone forth is wide open. It is not easy while living in a home to lead the holy life utterly perfect and pure as a polished shell. Suppose that I shave off my hair and beard and I put on a yellow robe and I go forth from the home life into homelessness. Later, while still young, this black-haired young man endowed with the blessings of youth in his prime of life, he did just that. Let's go back to 26. And go to 14. Though my mother and father wished otherwise and wept with cheerful faces, I did shave off my hair and beard and put on a yellow robe, and I went forth from the home life into homelessness. And having gone forth in search of 
what is wholesome, seeking the supreme state of sublime peace, I went to Alara Kalama and said to him, friend Kalama, I want to lead the holy life in this Dhamma and discipline. And Alara Kalama replied, the venerable one may stay here. This Dhamma is such that a wise man can soon enter upon and abide in it, realizing for himself through direct knowledge, his own teacher's doctrine. So he's saying they've reached a certain point and if you come to practice with me, you can reach that point also. And I soon quickly learned that Dhamma as far as mere lip reciting and rehearsal of his teachings went. And I could speak with knowledge and assurance and I claimed I know and see. And there were others who also did likewise. I considered this is not enough. This is not through mere faith alone that Alara Kalama declares. By realizing for myself with direct knowledge, I entered upon and abided in the Dhamma. Certainly Alara Al Kalama abides knowing and seeing this Dhamma. And then I went to Alara Kalama and asked him, friend Kalama, in what way do you declare that my, by realizing for yourself with direct knowledge, you enter upon and abide in this Dhamma? And in reply, he declared, base of nothingness. So that's as far as um, Alara Kalama went to the base of nothingness. So that would be the four Rupa Jhanas, one, two, and three, and four. And then infinite space, infinite consciousness, and nothingness. And this is where he stops. That's where Alara Kalama went to that far. I considered not only Alara Kalama has faith, energy, mindfulness, concentration, and wisdom. I too have faith, energy, concentration, and wisdom. This is your faculties. Suppose I endeavor to realize the Dhamma that Alara Kalama declares he enters upon and abides in by realizing for himself with direct knowledge I soon quickly entered upon and abided in that Dhamma by realizing for myself with direct knowledge. And then I went to Alara Kalama and asked him, friend Kalama, is it in this way that you declare that you enter upon and abide in this Dhamma by realizing for yourself with direct knowledge? Now, direct knowledge is basically knowing it by seeing it for yourself. And he is showing him how you can do that. And that is the way, friend, it is in this way, friend, that I also enter upon and abide in the Dhamma by realizing for myself with direct knowledge. It is a gain for us, friend. This is the Lara Klama saying, it's a gain for us, friend. It's a great gain for us that we have such a venerable one for our companion in the holy life. So, the Dhamma that I declare, enter, I enter upon and abide in by realizing it for myself with direct knowledge in the Dhamma that you enter upon and abide in by realizing for yourself with direct knowledge. And the Dhamma that you enter upon and abide in by realizing for yourself through direct knowledge is the same one that I realize through direct knowledge. As I am, so you are. As you are, so I am. So come, friend, and let us now lead the community together. It's a big deal. So he's invited to run one of the largest schools there is at that time in teaching people to get to that level. Thus, Alara Kalama, my teacher, placed me, his pupil, on an equal footing with himself, awarded me the highest honor. But it occurred to me, this Dhamma does not lead to disenchantment, to dispassion, to cessation, to peace, to direct knowledge, to enlightenment, to Nibbana, but only to the reappearance in the base of nothingness. So Nibbana is an opening. They're looking for this opening that is 
when you come out of it, all of the habitual tendencies of grabbing onto things are gone. Everything looks clear. Everything looks bright. And as it actually is, without anything touching it from the past or touching it from anxiety for the future is gone. But not being satisfied with that Dhamma, disappointed with it, I left. Now the story goes that he then goes to Udaka Ramaputta. And Udaka Ramaputta, he has reached another level, which is neither perception or non-perception. And the story is almost identical which what happens at that time. And then he comes back, but he kept on thinking that this was not enough and he left Ramaputta also. And now he's saying, back in 36, he's saying, I sat down there thinking this will serve for striving. I will keep going as much as I can. There are three similes occurring to me spontaneously, never heard before. Suppose there was a wet, sappy piece of wood lying in the water, and a man came with an upper fire stick thinking, I shall light a fire, and I shall produce heat. What do you think? Could the man light a fire and produce heat? by taking the upper fire stick and rubbing it against a wet sappy piece of wood that is lying in the water? No, it wouldn't work. It's wet and sappy, that piece of wood. It's lying in the water and eventually the man would only reap only weariness and disappointment. And so too, what I did as to those recluses and Brahmins who do not live bodily withdrawn from sensual pleasures and whose sensual desires and affection and fatuation and thirst and fever for the sensual pleasures has not been fully abandoned and, su and suppressed. And I don't like that word, you know that, okay. Internally, even if those good recluses and Brahmins feel painful, racking, piercing feelings, due to exertion, they are incapable of knowledge and vision and the supreme enlightenment. One of the things the Buddha did when he started teaching, he took away the teacher-student relationship that existed with the gurus at the time, where they said it, you listened and you did it and you did not question anything, okay? Instead, he began to teach with knowledge and vision purely to reach a supreme opening and a supreme enlightenment. And it was an awakening. You've probably heard Bhante, if you have listened to our teacher, you have listened to him say many times that enlightenment is to enlighten you, is to tell you something you don't know. That's when I enlighten you. But to awaken you is quite different. To awaken your reactions and change your behavior, that's quite different. And that is what the Buddha was doing in his teaching that was quite different from before. So as to the recluses and Brahmins who still do not live bodily withdrawn in, these, in this way, even those good recluses and Brahmins would feel painful, racking, piercing feelings deal to, due to the exertion that they are incapable of knowledge and vision and supreme enlightenment. And even if they those recluses and Brahmins did not feel that painful, racking, piercing feelings due to exertion. They are incapable of knowledge and vision and supreme enlightenment. And this was the first simile that occurred to me spontaneously. Then it goes to another. A second simile occurred to me, never before spoken of. Suppose that there was a wet sappy piece of wood lying on dry land far from the water and a man came with an upper fire stick thinking he could light a fire and could produce heat what do you think do you think that he could light a fire and produce heat by taking the upper fire stick and rubbing it against the wet sappy piece of wood lying on the land far from the water no, it will not work, Master Godama. Why not? Because it is wet, 
sappy piece of wood still, even though it is lying on dry land far from the water, eventually the man would reap only weariness and disappointment. And so too, as to the recluses and Brahmins who li live bodily withdrawn from sensual pleasures, but whose sensual desire, affection, infatuation, and thirst and fever for sensual pleasures has not been fully abandoned and suppressed internally, well, then even if those good recluses and Brahmins feel painful, racking, piercing feelings due to exertion, they're incapable of knowledge and vision and supreme enlightenment. And even if those good recluses and Brahmins do not feel painful, racking, piercing feelings due to exertion, they're incapable of knowledge and vision and supreme enlightenment. This was the second simile that came to me. And a third simile arose. Suppose there was a dry, sapless piece of wood by the dry land far from the water, and the man came with a fire stick, I shall light a fire, I shall produce heat. And what do you think? Could the man light the fire and produce heat by rubbing it against the dry sapless piece of wood that's lying on dry land far from the water? Yes, Master Godama, because it is a sapless piece of wood and it is lying on dry land far from water. So too, as to those recluses and Brahmins who live bodily withdrawn from sensual pleasures, whose desire, affection, infatuation, and thirst and fever for sensual pleasures has been fully abandoned and suppressed internally, even if those good recluses and Brahmins feel these painful, racking, piercing feelings, Due to exertion, they are capable of knowledge and vision and supreme enlightenment. Even if those good recluses and Brahmins do not feel this painful, racking, piercing feelings due to exertion, they are capable of knowledge and vision of supreme enlightenment. And this was the third simile that occurred to me, never heard before. And these are the three similes that occurred spontaneously, never heard before. So this is where now he starts to look at different ways of suppressing anything that would disturb him. And this is the really important part is this part I'm going to read you because this is showing he tried so extremely hard. But although tireless energy was aroused in him an unremitting mindfulness was established. He kept his observation going. His body was painful and it had, uh, was um, overwrought and uncalm because he exhausted by the painful striving. But such painful feeling that arose in him did not invade his mind and remain. He realized that he couldn't make any progress by trying to stop anything. He realized that these painful racking feelings, they, they would not invade his mind and stay there. He was realizing Anicca, gradually realizing this Anicca is always going to go away. It's always going to pass away. But he thought if I practice the breathing meditate, breathingless meditation, which was something they tried to force enough pain in the body so mind would open is the, what's going on here and suppose I practice the breathingless meditation I stopped the in-breaths and out-breaths through my mouth and nose and when I did this so was a loud sound of winds coming out of my ear holes but just as there is a loud sound with a smith's bellows are blown so too when while I stopped the in-breaths and out-breaths through my nose and ears, there was a loud sound of winds coming out of my ear holes. But although tireless energy was aroused in me and unremitting mindfulness was established, the body was overwrought and it was uncalm because I was exhausted from the painful striving. See, what he's learning here gradually, he's learning 
that um, even if he tries extremely hard, and I missed one paragraph I need to read to you, um, even if he tries extremely hard, he's learning the principle of if you try hard and exhaust your body, when you exhaust your body, you hurt your mindfulness. Your mindfulness drops and you're hurting your ability to observe and watch what you're trying to learn inside. That's what's happening. He thought, suppose with my teeth clenched and my tongue pressed above the roof of my mouth, I beat down and constrain mind with mind. And so with my teeth clenched and my tongue pressed against the roof of my mouth, I beat down and constrained and crushed mind with mind. While I did so, sweat ran from my armpits. And just as a strong man might seize a weaker man by the head or shoulders and beat him down and constrain him and crush him, so too with my teeth clenched and my tongue pressed above the roof of my mouth, I beat down constrained and crushed mind with mine and sweat ran from my armpits. But once again, tireless energy was, uh, uh, was aroused in me. And even though an unremitting mindfulness was established, my body became overwrought. So he keeps failing. He keeps failing by trying too hard. And he's beginning to understand the pieces of what we're training you. He's beginning to experience the problem when Atta is there very, very strong. You see, it's just going to exhaust him. Now, this paragraph is very interesting because in 36, paragraph 20 is being described to you as a failure. But in the sutta number 20, it's being given to you as something you could try in order to get rid of your uh, hindrance. But it's not advised. In 36, this, he's, what he's giving you here is he's giving you a list of how he tried all different things to get rid of things that were bothering him and pulling his attention away. But he's telling them, don't do this. This is a statement, don't do this one. This is how I failed. We get to the next one, he's holding his breath. The next one, he holds his breath longer. He stops the in-breaths and out-breaths through the mouth, nose, and ears. And when he did so, then it was so serious. Violent winds cut through my head, just as a strong man were to crush my head with the tip of a sharp sword. So too, all that pain, and while I stopped in the in-breaths and out-breaths through my mouth, nose, and ears, violent winds cut through my head. But although this tireless energy was aroused in me and unremitting mindfulness was established, he was watching, okay? My body was overwrought and uncalm because I was exhausted by the painful striving. Later on in his teaching, he tells us point blank, do not exhaust your body. If you do, then your mind will not be able to watch and understand what you're going to understand. This is really important, yeah? So then he's holding his breath again. I practiced further breathingless meditation and stopped the in-breaths and the out-breaths through the mouth, the nose, and the ears. And when I did this, then the violent pains in my head, and this was the same as tightening a tough leather strap around my head as a headband. And when I stopped the in-breaths and out-breaths through my mouth and nose, there were violent pains in my head. But again, this tireless energy was aroused in me an unremitting mindfulness kept watching, but my body was overwrought and uncalm because I was exhausted by painful striving. You don't starve yourself. You don't cheat your sleep. This bit about Westerners going to Asian centers where they've been going to bed at 10 and getting up at four or three, and they asking you to do that we had a woman who came back from that and died in the retreat. She didn't tell us she had come back from that. And we were giving the person eight hours to sleep, but she couldn't do it. She was down to two hours of sleep. There was no instruction by the Buddha to cut your sleep down and to we say sleep deprivation. There was no practice that he taught of sleep deprivation. 
You want less and less sleep when you are practicing for hours. You, it makes it so your body doesn't need as much sleep. I got down to three hours and then I had an accident and they said, you have to sleep for 10 hours. I can't sleep for 10 hours, but I slept for eight, you know, but even now I, I'm on a cycle where I'm getting up at three 30 or four o'clock because why? Because I'm sitting in the time frame when there's no sound here at all. Why? Because consciousness is turned off. Everybody's sleeping in the whole neighborhood. Even the dogs are sleeping. From 3.30 to 4.30, nobody is awake. You don't have to go to a meditation center to find this, okay? You can just get up at uh, three o'clock, wash your face, with, put some ice water on a washcloth, put it on your head, get nice and settle down in a good, quiet position. Nothing's gonna disturb you. There's nobody waking up. Nobody's getting up till 4.30 or so, 4, 4.30. They go a long way to work, but they're not gonna start doing it till four or 4.30. The gurus are advertising on the internet. If you wanna really go someplace, come with me and sit from 3.20 to 3.45. I love it, 3.20 to 3.45. I don't see anything special in that. I tried it a few times, but 3.30 to 4.30 or four o'clock to five o'clock, it's incredible. All you have to do to experience that is go to sleep at about nine or 10 o'clock and you'd be perfectly fine to try it. You know, don't go back to bed when you finish. Don't go back to bed. Go get your shower then. When you come out of it, quietly go get your shower. Nobody else is up yet. Yeah. And let it flow through you. You know, this is a marvelous experience. Absolutely priceless. So then he holds his breath longer and it's like a butcher's knife stabbing him and longer. And the next time it's like two strong men are roasting him over a pit of a hot pit in 25. And he says, he keeps going like that, okay? And then he's saying, basically in 26, he's saying he nearly died because what he started to do was he stopped eating. You know, with the breathless part, he stopped, he stopped so he, he started, he nearly died from this breathless practice and the deities came back and they were mad at him. And now when the deities saw me, some said the recluse Godama is dead. Other deities said, no, the recluse Godama is not dead. He is dying. And other deities said, oh, the recluse Godama is not dead or dying. He's an Arahant. <laughs> He's an Arahant. So for such is the way of these Arahants that abide. Now he, they're all three wrong right? He was dying. He was really in trouble. He's a human being and he was stretching too far. Now, then it comes out, suppose that we're in 27 now on page 339. Suppose I practice entirely cutting off my food. Bad idea. He's going to torture his body. So he's going to fast. Now here comes your fasting. The deity said to me, Go, good sir, do not practice entirely cutting off your food, please. If you do so, we shall infuse heavenly food into your pores of your skin, and you will live on that. And the Buddha considered this, if I claim to be completely fasting, while these deities infuse heavenly food into the pores of my skin, and I live on that, then I shall be lying. And he'll feel guilty about it if he's doing that. And so I dismissed the deities saying, no, no, there's no need, there's no need, and sent them away. I'll take very little food, a handful each time, whether it's bean soup or lentil soup or the veg soup or pea soup, just a little food, a handful at a time, uh, whether it's bean soup or lentil soup or uh, to no extreme of, I might reach a state of extreme emaciation when he did that, that's what happened to him. And because of eating so little, my limbs became like the jointed segments of vines and stems on the bamboo stems. And because of eating so little, my backside became like a camel's hoof. That's very rough and hard. And because of eating so little, the projections 
on my spine stood forth like corded beads. Because of eating so little, my ribs jutted out as gaunt as the crazy rafters of an old roofless barn. Because of eating so little, the gleam of my eyes sank far down into their sockets, looking like the gleam of water that had sunk far down into a deep well. And because of eating so little, my scalp shriveled and withered. A green bitter gourd shrivels in the same way and withers in the wind and sun. And because of eating so little, my belly skin adhered to my backbone. You know, when I had my first baby, I was on a gurney in the hallway. I didn't get to go in the delivery room because she came very fast. And the doctor had a real sense of humor. <laughs> and I'm lying on the gurney and the baby came out and the doctor has the baby and I'm cold because they took my heater out and the baby's like a heater inside me. And then what happened was he's really got a sense of humor. He came over, he says, give me your hand. I was just shaking. He says, you want to see something interesting? And I said, yeah, what? He said, give me your hand. He lifted up the cover and he put my hand right here. And I, he took it and pushed it and I could feel my backbone with my hand. Any pregnant woman who has a baby right afterwards, they can do this because they took the baby out and the organs had not fallen in yet. This is like 20 minutes after she's born, you know? And I thought, oh my gosh, that's my backbone. I can feel my bone of my spine, the different discs, I could feel them. It was really something. And I giggled because I'm so curious. I think other women maybe would have laid there and screamed. <laughs> you know, I just thought it was really interesting. And here's this description. When I saw this, I thought, wow, he was that skinny that skinny. He pushed his belly skin and it adhered to his backbone inside. And thus, if I touched my belly skin, I encountered my backbone. If I touched my backbone, I encountered my belly skin. Same as me. He turned me on my side and he showed me how that works. Because of eating so little, I defecated. If I defecated or I urinated, I fell over on my face right there because of eating so little, if I tried to ease my body by rubbing my limbs with my hands, the hair rotted at its roots and it fell from my body as I rubbed. Your hair is on your legs, your hair on your head, your hair anywhere just falls right off completely. Now, when people saw me, they said, oh, the recluse Godama is black. Other people said the recluse Godama is not black, he is brown. Other people said the recluse Godama is neither black nor brown. He is golden skinned. So much had the clear bright color of my skin deteriorated through eating so little. And now at 30, we start to hear some interesting stuff. I thought whatever recluses and Brahmins in the past have experienced painful racking piercing feelings due to exertion that this is the utmost there is none beyond this and whatever recluses and brahmins in the future will experience painful racking piercing feelings due to such exertion this is the utmost there is none beyond this and whatever recluses and brahmins at present experience the same pains due to this exertion, it's the utmost. There is none beyond this. But by this racking practice of austerities, I have not attained any superhuman states, any distinction in knowledge and vision worthy that I could say I was a noble one. Nothing. Could there be another path to enlightenment? This is the magic point right here. I'm reading it to you. What happened? Why was Gotama able to go through and become awakened under the tree? What changed in his practice that became different? What changed? Listen carefully. 
Could there be another path to enlightenment? And then he says, I considered, I recall when my father, the Sakyan, was occupied. While I was sitting in the cool shade of the rose apple tree, he's talking about the celebration of the plowing ceremonies, the Uravela plowing ceremony, and the memory of what happened that day changed his practice. And this is what you need to get out of this. What changed? While I was sitting in the cool shade of the rose apple tree, quite secluded from sensual pleasures, secluded from unwholesome states, he was cut off from the plowing field. He was set on the side of the field and the plowing, the silver plow was in the middle of the field for the celebration. He was away from the people, which means he was secluded from any sensual sights or sounds or smells of anything and secluded from being any people around him or secluded from any unwholesome states. He was just sitting under the tree. I entered and abided in the first jhana. He fell into that jhana. He didn't do anything to get there. You understand? He didn't try. He didn't grasp. He didn't push. He didn't suffer. He didn't have pain. Later in his teaching, he tells us, Ananda asks him, you are a magnificent teacher, he says. <laughs> and he was the attendant for the Buddha. The two of them are alone. And he says that, and the Buddha says, why am I a magnificent teacher? And he says, well, first of all, you gave us the modes of progress so that we as monks, we would know how we were progressing in our practice, he said. This is in the um, Digga Nikaya, okay? And you can find it, wait a minute, I'll tell you. You can find it in, let me see. Digga Nikaya number 28, section 10. You can find this, the modes of progress. Always remember that. Because good progress, uh, you know, excellent progress and poor progress, the Buddha had a measurable outcome for training his monks. He was measuring their progress and telling them how they could measure it. Now, listen carefully. If you have a painful meditation and slow comprehension of the Dhamma, that is poor progress. If you have a painful meditation and quick comprehension of the Dhamma, that is still considered poor progress. That was interesting to me because so many people were practicing with so much pain. And here's the Buddha saying, if it's painful, whether you have slow or quick comprehension of the Dhamma, it doesn't matter. If you have sitting with this pain, there's something wrong. That is poor progress. Then he says, if you are sitting in pleasant meditation with slow comprehension, that is poor progress. That's the third one. The only one that's excellent is if you're sitting in a pleasant meditation with quick comprehension of the Dhamma. So what does this tell you? First of all, it's telling you when you're being trained in a meditation, if you're serious about getting to experience Nibbana, you have to have a parallel training, two prongs. You have to have the comprehension of the Dhamma necessary to support your practice, and you have to have the practice. So you're not being graded on how long you can sit and concentrate hard or chase hindrances away or fight with hindrances or anything like that. You are being graded on how you can sit in a pleasant meditation with quick comprehension of the Dhamma that supports the meditation practice. Like in this book, in Majjhima Nikaya has 152 suttas. We know that 76 of them have really good information to help your meditation. The rest of them are conversations about peacemaking and you know different kinds of questions people ask. That interesting, but 76 of these suttas in this book are helpful for your meditation. Then Bhante chooses 22 of them as the prime source for his retreats. 22, now the index I'm writing now that I'm trying to get ready for the publisher, that one 
shows you the 76 and takes out the 22 and shows you the 22. When you come to a retreat with us, you go through 10 days. You have six or eight topics that have to be woven together into like a weaving. They have to fit together in your mind to support your understanding. At the same time, you're learning what he's discovering here. So listen carefully. I entered upon and abided in the first jhana, which is accompanied by thinking and examining thought with joy and happiness born of seclusion. Could that be the, the path to enlightenment? That was the first jhana description. Then following on the memory came the realization Bingo, that indeed is the path to enlightenment. It was like, bingo, I've been trying too hard. I've been pushing too hard. I've had so much pain. I almost killed myself. The devas got shook up. Everybody got shook up. Now I'm going to change and see if something else works. He's thinking. Yeah. So we see the movie with Keanu Reeves in it, where he gets excited and he figures this out and he gets in the river and he takes a bath, you know, that's the first thing he does. He cleans himself up because he was a real grub at that point. And then we, we hear the story of the woman comes and she starts to feed him the milk rice and he starts to revive himself from being stripped down to a skeleton. Why am I afraid of the pleasure that has nothing to do with sensual pleasures and unwholesome states, he says. He's talking about why are you afraid of feeling joy when it comes up? Why would you ever be afraid of joy? Let's talk about joy. I mean, come on. Joy, when you're happy, human beings smile, right? You smile. There's nothing wrong with that, okay? Anybody who says you can't be a Buddhist unless you stop smiling, he doesn't understand. They don't understand what the Buddha was teaching. You're only in trouble if you think I got to be like this and I got to be like this all the time or people aren't going to like me. I got to stay like this all day at work or people aren't going to like me. You know, give it up. <laughs> okay. When you're going to smile, you smile because the feeling of smiling wasn't there. It arose. The feeling was there, it passed away. And you learned that all feelings arise, they're there and they pass away. And they pass away, why? Because of the law of Anicca. It's a law. Everything that arises passes away. Wow, when you told me that, I thought, my golly gosh, gee whiz, why was I so upset growing up? <laughs> everything that was happening it was going to happen and then go away but nobody ever told me that so I was suffering terribly terribly when I was growing up truly truly so the next thing it says here is I thought I am not afraid of that kind of pleasure since it has nothing to do with sensual pleasures and unwholesome states that's right that's right. And I considered it is not easy to attain that pleasure with a body so excessively emaciated. Suppose I ate some solid food and he took the boiled rice and then he ate the porridge later. And I ate some solid food, boiled rice and porridge. And now at the time, at that time, the five bhikkhus were waiting upon me. They were thinking, if our recluse Gotama achieves some higher state, he will inform us. But when I ate the boiled rice and porridge, the five bhikkhus were disgusted with me thinking, now they, they didn't understand yet, you see, they didn't understand. So they said, this recluse Gotama now lives luxuriously. He has given up his striving and reverted to luxury. Now, when I had eaten solid food and regained my strength, then quite secluded from sensual pleasures, secluded from unwholesome states, I entered upon and I, I sat in the first jhana. And then with rapture, joy and happiness born of seclusion. But this, such pleasant feelings that arose in me did not invade my mind and remain. Why? Because they pass away because of Anicca. 
You see, we don't take enough time when we're talking about meditation to discuss the natural laws of the universe. There's all sets, there's like about 10 or 11 laws. I, I need, it's almost time for me to give that class again. You know, maybe next time we'll bring up the 10 or 11 laws that we figured out are absolutes laws that we cannot break if we are going to meditate and be successful and reach path very smoothly and start to go through the jhana, jhana, journey down the jhanas, okay? And with the stilling of the thinking and examining thought, I entered upon and abided in the second jhana. He's talking about under the tree now. He's talking about this experience. And with the fading away as well of joy, I entered upon and abided in the third jhana, yep. And with the abandoning of pleasure and pain, I entered upon and abided in the fourth jhana, yep, that's right but such pleasant feelings that arose in me each time did not invade my mind and remain. They always came and passed away, came and passed away. You go and you read Anupada Sutta, Majima Nikaya number 111, you read Anupada Sutta, Sariputta's experience, step by step, one by one, what's it say? One by one. <laughs> One by one, he saw everything one by one. I can't believe I can't remember that. <laughs> That's really funny. But one by one, they occurred. One by one, they occurred. He saw them occur. Oh, he wasn't in absorption. Yeah. One of the things he figured out was what it was like to sit under the tree. <laughs> And when you don't understand what happened to him, how did he change? Why did he stop? being tense and trying hard to get to Nibbana. Why did he do that? You have to go into a botanical garden or somewhere where there is a big tree about this big round and you need to sit at the base of the tree on a blanket, okay? And put the bug spray around. <laughs> and, you need, and you need to get quiet and just stay under the tree. You see, you can even rest by the tree with your back, it's okay. If you're very quiet, you can feel the life of the tree behind you. If you're calm enough and you let everything go out of your mind, you can feel the flow of the life in the tree. But you have to let go of everything, everything to do that, okay? But just see what happens when you're there. In order to close your eyes and simply watch and not move at all while you're sitting under the tree. This is what we did on the mountain when Bonte taught us this the first time. He said, you don't understand. You don't understand. You're asking so many questions. Go out and sit under the tree tomorrow when you're working in the forest. Stop working like you stop working and sit for an hour. But pick a tree this time. Don't sit on a fallen tree. Don't sit on a rock. Sit where there's a big tree and it's quiet in the forest and just sit there and see for yourself what happens it's a whole different ball game whole different ball game now i'm not going to go any further with this i'm going to talk to you a little bit about the practice the things that he really uncovered that was so important had to do with changing First, he discovered right effort, but you have three pieces, six, seven, and eight on the uh, eightfold path. You have the eight piece, Samawayama, right? And Samawayama is right effort. This, the next one is right, uh, right, right mindfulness. And we change this and we call right effort harmonious practice. And I'll tell you why in a second. And then we call uh, the right mindfulness harmonious observation. It's harmonious because you understand how everything is working together and you're just watching inside and you're never distracted by anything that arises. You never move over to it. Why? Well, because we teach you about the hindrances and how they actually operate when we're training you. You may never engage a hindrance. If you go to Sutta number 22 in section six, I'm pretty sure it's six. Sex, sutta number 22 and you go to section six, you're going to find a statement that tells you whenever 
I mean, I got to get it for you. I want to read it directly to you. Okay. You, this is the sentences. The, the monk is insisting that it is okay to engage a hindrance. What does it mean to engage a hindrance? If you're watching the breath, for instance, or you're sending metta, that's your object, right? So if you engage a hindrance, you leave this and you go over here to engage this. That's what it means. You engage it. So to engage, it means move away from what you're doing and start doing something else, right? So now Bhakti likes to use the word indulge, which is one step beyond because when I move over here, engage it, I'm going to indulge in it. That means where did you come from? Where did you come from? My past? Who, why are you here? What are you here to bother me for? And you start asking a lot and get interested in that. If you do that, my goodness, you're not meditating on the breath and you're not meditating on metta anymore. You just started a new investigative meditation school. Okay. And your job was to go over to anything that pops up and investigate it. That's what you just did. Okay. So what did the Buddha say about this? He would, well, the monks were upset about the monk named Arati. Okay. And Arati was the one who believed that you could go over. There was nothing wrong with engaging a hindrance. So he comes to talk to him and he says, misguided man. That means, ah, why didn't you listen to me? <laughs> That's what it means. Okay, misguided man, to whom have you ever known me to teach the Dhamma in this way? Misguided man, have I not stated in many ways how obstructions are obstructions and how they are able to obstruct you who, if you engage in them? This is what this means. So an obstacle that appears in your mind is nothing it's going to pass away. And Nietzsche says it's going to pass away. But if an obstacle arises, a thought or something in your mind, and you engage it, you turn it into something more. So that's the number one place we look. Now, another place that we, we take you to when we're talking about hindrances into, is into the Samyutta Nikaya. In the Samyutta Nikaya, in the Bojanga Samyutta, you need to go to the Bojanga Samyutta. And if you look inside uh, Bhikkhu Bodhi Samyutta Nikaya, there's a whole lesson that Bojanga is the seven enlightenment factors. And that's what the, the book is about. But listen, there's a discussion in there that's really important, okay? <laughs> because in order for you to fall into cessation, you have to have these seven enlightenment factors perfectly aligned in order to fall into cessation. They, have, they can't be working like this anymore, like this. So much of this, little of that, little of that, dot, 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 it has to go, boop, and then you get to go to the next level into cessation. But how do you get them to arise and what keeps them from arising are the hindrances. They have to do with this, okay? The distractions that come up, okay? And so in this, in this Samyutta Nikaya, it's, you look in there and you will find, it's on 1597, I'm pretty sure, but let me grab this a minute. It's in 1597, there is a discussion section. And the discussion session is talking to you about this very same problem. There we go. And it has to do with careful attention or careless attention. This is what you're going to be discussing. 1597. Yeah, 1597. This is a lesson on nutriment, but listen carefully to what it is. This is about the nutriment, the, nour the nutriment and the denourishment in regards to the five hindrances and the seven enlightened factors of enlightenment. That's what it is. I'll do it again. It is a lesson on the nutriment and the denourishment in regard to the five hindrances and the seven factors of enlightenment. So it's about the nourishment or the denourishment of a hindrance. When a hindrance comes up, 
if you're having trouble with hindrances, why are you having trouble with hindrances? Because you don't understand how they work. Once you understand how they operate, well, then you can fix it, right? But you can't fix something unless you understand how it works. So here it's explaining to you seven times, each section is seven times. There's seven enlightenment factors. The first one is your uh, mindfulness and then investigation, energy, and joy. And then you have tranquility, um, tranquility, uh, collectedness, uh, collectedness and concentration is the, the last three. So that's seven pieces. So they put seven times they're showing you what happens if what nourishes these and what makes them come up. So the nutriments for the hindrances, are you ready? When, uh, what is the nutriment for the arising of unarisen sensual desire and for the increase and expansion of the arisen sensual desire? There is the sign of the beautiful frequently giving careless attention to it is the nutriment for the arising of the unarisen sensual desire for the increase and expansion of the arisen sensual desire. So in layman's terms, this is saying, you know, if you really like something, if you pay attention to it, it's going to get bigger. Okay. You're going to feed it with your personal attention. They're calling this, this careless attention, your personal attention. Um, a pin, your personal attention to it. That's what's feeding it. So now let's take it, let's just pretend if you're coming from someplace where they told you the hindrances were enemies, let's pre pretend there is a war, okay? There's a war coming and the hindrances the army is coming after us, okay? And they're gonna get us into the dark night of the soul and they're not gonna let us go, all right? So now in an army, we, we are all concerned with strategy. And, and the way to stop a war very quickly is if you know very clearly the other side has a supply route to it. And if you take away the supply route for the army, if you attack the supply route, not the army, just blow up the roads they use for their food, the army is going to go home. See? That's how it works. You are the food for the hindrance. Stop. <laughs> Don't pay attention to it at all. Let it be. So how can I do that? It comes up in my mind and it goes all over the place. How can I do that? It's coming up all over the place. Ah, yes. But I told you, you can sit there and you're practicing right here, but your brain, there is nothing in the Dhamma anywhere that says you're supposed to stop your brain from producing thoughts. Nothing. I looked all over for it. There's nothing there. You're not supposed to stop your brain. You're supposed to leave it alone because leave it alone and they'll go home and they'll take their, their anxiety and stress behind them. They'll take it with them and they'll leave because you don't feed them anymore. If you don't feed them, then they can't exist and it will fade away. Now, this is actually the truth and it's not being told to a lot of people. And this is real. It, we tested it and it works perfectly. You just let it go. So what did we, what did we just talk about those pieces in the Eightfold Path? The first one was right effort, okay? And it's a harmonious practice of what? See, now you're all thinking she said effort. Uh-oh, she wants us to work hard and persevere and push down and suppress and subdue the hindrances. No, 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 I don't want you to do that. If you look in the texts, in, look in 77 if you want, go in Majima Nikai number 77 and read what right striving is and find, look up the right effort that you can find one of those two. Look at the same exact paragraph, right? Effort is when you're doing what I'm telling you to do and you have to think about it. 
Right striving is when the brain decides, oh, that's what you want me to do. Well, why didn't you tell me? I can just let it go when it comes up and it starts doing it automatically, see? Okay, so right effort, Sama Wayama, four steps, has four steps. This gets so exciting. Oh my gosh, okay, let's look, let's see what it says. Four steps, I'll tell you the steps first and you write them down. You recognize there's an unwholesome mind state in your mind, an unwholesome mind state. Oh, that's a hindrance. An imperfection is a hindrance, right? A taint, fetter, you know, distraction, disturbance, annoyance, okay? But you recognize there's an unwholesome mind state in your mind, the step one. Step two, ready for step two? Release the unwholesome mind state and please relax your head. Just relax your head. If you have questions about that later, we'll explain where it came from. But you, re you, you release the unwholesome mind state. Number three, bring up a wholesome mind state. And we're gonna tell you the fastest way that you can bring the, the mind from this that's tense to this like that is to smile. Okay, so you smile in this practice. Some people say we're teaching a smiling meditation. Okay, we're teaching you how this was originally done. You smile. And the monks, I know you might not believe me, but all the monks back then, they were smiling. That's how come the people supported them. It's how come they brought them the food and they made sure they had enough cloth and they had enough medicine and they were supported. That's why, because they made them feel good whenever you saw the monks, they were smiling, okay? Nowadays, it's like, yeah, I'm a monk. Been a monk for 20 years, yeah, I did. Mm -hmm. I will teach you the Dhamma. Let's start with the precepts. Okay, here we go. <laughs> no, no, no. I'll start with the precepts, but I want you to learn the hindrances too. Ha <laughs> ha, together, see? Because if you keep your precepts, they work as an umbrella over top of you so that the hindrances cannot get to you. But if you break the precept, this one's gonna get in in a couple more. Your precepts operate as a umbrella for you to keep the hindrances from attacking you. And they're not attacking you, by the way. We can't call the police and we can't arrest them and we can't take them to court because of why. <laughs> the hindrances are innocent. They are innocent. We are the ones that are in trouble here, not understanding how they work. Once we understand how they work, we recognize the unwholesome, we release the unwholesome and relax, we re-smile as we come back and continue on. That was it. We're, now here are the four steps again. Recognize the unwholesome mind state, release the unwholesome mind state. Oh, you're purifying your mind. You are purifying the mind. Now bring up a wholesome and keep the wholesome going and make more wholesome things happen that feel the same way. And these two are retraining the mind, but doesn't it work if I just let it go and let it go and let it go? No, it doesn't. But won't it work if I suppress it and push it down and make it stop? No, it'll come back after the retreat and bite you while you're driving to school. <laughs> or it will come back in your life. What's happening in the hindrances in the meditation happen in life. If you really want to change it, you have to replace it. So when you recognize it and then you release it and then you bring up a replacement, the smile, and feel how that feels and you keep going to your object of meditation or to your task at school or your task at home or your task at work, it doesn't matter but you have to do all four steps to change. Change, people don't change. My father told me people can't change. That's silly, people can change and they proved it in science now. In the neuroscience, they proved that no matter how old you are, you can change. 
this is the greatest news anybody could have told a depressed person on the face of the earth. Depression is rampant in the whole world. And this person, this, this research did not get the Nobel Prize. And I can't figure it out. I can't, I don't think so anyway. It was 10 years ago. The first research came out for this, I think. Maybe it did happen. I don't know. I have to go back and look. But the point is, you can change. And the Buddha gave you this. He gave you a way to change. But he didn't demand you have to do it this way, that way. He's just telling you, this is how it worked when I did it. That's what he decided to teach. He was a prince, well-educated, could have taught anything, philosophy, anything at all, you know. He was a soldier, didn't decide to teach you archery or riding a horse or anything. And he was a genius in understanding how we suffer and the cause of it is the craving and the clinging. So it's perfectly all right for you to laugh when somebody tells you a, a funny joke. I'm not saying a dirty joke. I'm saying a, a funny thing about life happening, you know, funny jokes, clean jokes, you know. And it's fine for you to laugh, but don't you carry that with you all day and for the next three days and everything because here's where you live. You live in the present time where we started this whole conversation and somebody tells you something or you hear music that's really marvelous, go ahead and listen to it. But then can you, as you pass it and it happened here, can you leave it there and live? This is the way the Arahant is living. He's living free from carrying what happened before on top of him and not worrying about what's going to happen in the future, just concerned with himself, here he is now, and how can I help the people around me if they need help in the situation here and now? He's very much here and now, not in the present moment. Please don't struggle for that. I would like you to just struggle for <laughs> the present time and be happy, you know? I'll tell you something that's a real shock for me. In this teaching, I found out something. I was 50 when I came in to be a Buddhist. I was 50 years a Christian and no one told me this. They would say it was God's plan, everything that happened. Wow, that was not a cool plan, <laughs> okay? So I always had the clear understanding, everything happened to me, everything happened to me. But guess what, I'm gonna tell you a secret. Nothing ever happened to you. What if that's true, that nothing ever happened to you? Everything happened from you and how you decided to see the world. You decide how to put the perspective. And the right view is an impersonal perspective where you watch things as they actually are. You don't judge them. You don't jump on top of them. You just watch how it's happening and see what's really happening and do what's necessary to help people if you need to without harming yourself. You see, that's what you do. What's this all for? Why are we here? You're here so that you can learn to smile and so that you can help each other through all of this. The one thing that's happened on the earth right now is we have something in common beyond the fact that we have similar organs inside and blood flowing inside of us. We have COVID. And COVID locked us up. Now is the best time in the world to start laughing at this because eventually you and I both know and Nietzsche is coming <laughs> one of these days. You know, it just changed. It didn't change in a nice way right now, but at least we know it changes. And then I hear it might change again. I don't know if that might be not, but it does change. And eventually it's going to go pew and fall off the edge. That's what will happen. Or else we'll get more beautiful masks to wear. 
<laughs> you know, they might be. You never know what this is all about. There could be aliens and they could have funny looking faces that have big things like this over them and they want us to look more like them when they show up. And so what do they do? They give us a mask. That's what they do. They tell us if we wear a mask, we'll look more like them and they won't be afraid of us. So the whole thing is a big plan so we don't get eaten when they arrive because we'll look so silly. <laughs> I'm only kidding. And it's a make up a story. Make up a story about this. You have to have some fun with it. I think they had a lot of fun already because the boy who came over here to fix my computer this week, he had a black mask on with a big set of teeth across the front of it. <laughs> and I mean, a big set of teeth. And I'm, I kept going, are you really going to help my computer? You're not going to hurt it, are you? <laughs> and he fixed my computer. The Buddha, one thing about it is I had someone say, well, you know, in my religion, he, they said, the person really suffered. And I said, the Buddha really suffered. I only told you part of what he did. If you really want to know and you tell me you really want to know, I will read you another one that tells you everything he did as an aesthetic. And it isn't pretty. <laughs> So don't, you know, I would plan on eating dinner afterwards, you know, because it can get really rough. So anyway, I think we're just about finished tonight. If you have questions, um, it's kind of, what time is it, Monty? <laughs> what time is it? Do you know what time it is now? It's, it's, uh, it's, eight it's eight eight eight. okay. Eight so if you want to ask some questions, you can ask some questions now because we have some time. And uh, you, you just need to let me know. Any questions about this? Nobody has questions. I can't 